Hey, sub furies. Hey, sub furies. Hey, people of the present. Hey, people of the present. Titan Wing. We discuss the arguments for and against. All hail Mishka. Need a Momo, not like book. I bought the sword. It's pretty amazing. The million to read full stop. Christopher Paolini, author of The Inheritance Cycle. Adrian Tchaikovsky, author of Children of Time. Wake the hell up, samurai. I'm going to read my book and walk through the park. Stay nerdy, sub furies, and I'll see you in the future. Stay nerdy from Supreme Leader Momo, and we will see you in the future. A million people is a lot. For someone who comes from a country of five million, it's possibly more people than I have ever seen in my entire life. It's kind of difficult to even visualize. One of the weird things about this job is it messes with your ability to assess yourself. You know, am I doing well? And I tend to spiral. But honestly, when I put out the request for questions about hitting a million, I was really taken aback by so many more people than I thought uh, telling me what this channel, what I've kind of put together here has meant to them across their life. Uh, it gave me a nice kick in the head that I kind of needed, but I want to say thank you. Really deeply, personally, thank you. Uh, so we've got questions and they're going to be about writing, about YouTube, about reading about my personal life and about New Zealand because for some reason you're all really curious about New Zealand which is this country where I live. Can you tell us about your novels? Anything to be released soon? Now I know I haven't spoken about this a huge amount but I actually am already a published author. Several of my short stories have already been published in uh, short story magazines. Like look there's there's my name there's my name uh and that was a huge confidence booster for me and in you know in my faith in my own skills they're sci-fi and fantasy and most of them linked down below and i've got a few more coming this year but you're asking about novels like full length novels well i've only mentioned it a couple of times but i do have a sci-fi novel coming called three kinds of silence i'm literally in the last like one or two weeks of tweaking before i'm sending it off to agents and publishers it's about a young mum who has lost her daughter and is now really struggling to navigate this new world she finds herself in as well as an entity with multiple consciousnesses who has come to earth after losing their planet and everyone they've ever loved and if you know me it's about mental health because of course it is if you could compare your book to two other properties like x meets y which would you pick Arrival meets Beer Town by Frederick Backman. It's a story about how we understand ourselves in the wake of trauma and how it can separate us from other people as well. How many manuscripts have you finished or come close to finishing that will never see the light of day? All right, well, I have not one, but two whole fantasy series that I started writing when I was 12 through to like age I don't know, 20 maybe, uh, that I eventually had to just go scorched earth on. And I was like, no, nah, these are not going to work. I don't care how much work I put into it. It's just not going to happen. No, they're not going to see the light day. They're not going to be published. I've still got the files, but they're not happening. There's also another book, kind of new adult mental health focus that I did send out to agents and publishers, but then wasn't feeling super confident in it and put it away. That may come maybe one day if I reworked it. We don't know. This book though, you are gonna see. What was the first story you ever wrote? And I mean the first, as far back in childhood as you can remember. I wrote this basically crossover between Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, which is weird because I've never really been a Star Wars kid, but it was about pretty much dudes with magic swords that are basically lightsabers riding the huge, uh, you know, Nazgul beasts, right? The fell beasts. If I remember right, it starts off with Darth Sidious falling down the hole, but a stormtrooper catching him at the bottom and then he survives and goes on to be the bad guy. <laughs> Somehow, Palpatine returned. <laughs> What are the differences you've noticed between the things you wanted to write when you were younger and the things you want to write now? Oh, easy. Two things. Number one, I was really into fantasy and now I'm really into sci-fi. Number two, I was huge into that, you know, big world building magic systems, huge cast of characters. And now I'm into really narrow, focused, 
intimate, more literary uh, sci-fi that's usually a lot more psychological. And you'll see that in my novel. Do you have a bunch of stories in your head you want to write fighting for your attention? How do you deal with it? Actually, I seem to be the only writer in the entire world who doesn't have an endless stream of ideas. I just, I just don't. When I tend to get like a real idea for a story, I tend to do it. Since I started writing short stories, that's a little bit less that case because, you know, they're, they're like little tiny stories that I can usually throw together relatively quickly. But in terms of like actual novel ideas, I don't ever tend to really seriously consider something until I've got like an, an issue I really care about, you know, that I want to write about, you know, mental health or, or something like that. But I mean, yeah, no, I, I do not have like a novel that is screaming at my head right now. I'm simply focused on the one that I want to, to finish and get done and I'm obsessed with it. Bees? Bees. What's the most batshit insane thing you've ever written? I love this question. No context. This is from my novel. First shoved second and third assigned to seize the reins of cognition. Rising through the ranks as fair and thought. Admonishing the rest of me for the worst of case scenario. Second and assisted would never come to pass. Because I was brilliantly smart and had great judgment when that was being proved palpably untrue. No, it was stupid of me to want such things. To even try to connect with you. To whom it may concern? What a ridiculous infantile line. There was a reason the exoskeletals threw my friend down that well and you would do the same to me and I would deserve it. That was the truth of it. I should run away like a pathetic roach, slink back into the infinite dark from whence I came. Which part of writing do you like the most? I love writing inside my characters' heads. I love these ponderous scenes where characters are thinking and feeling and reflecting and building up to a big decision and getting inside their psychology, you know. Um, and you'll see that in my novel. Where do you derive your inspiration for your writing and do you have a writing routine? Well, Inspiration, is be I suppose the best thing I could say is that it comes from the stories I read because I'll very often read a book and I'll be like, wow, this is incredible. You know, Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation. I read that and I was like, oh my goodness, I want to write something just like this. <laughs> uh, and as for my writing routine, I want to be very clear. This is my job, okay? Like people ask this a lot and, and I'm very fortunate in that I am able to set aside like a day where I can just write as part of my job. I do not have the nine to five structure a lot of people have to deal with, right? So, I mean, my, my routines are a bit more flexible, but things that I do do. Number one, I allow myself a really good night's sleep beforehand. Um, and so I won't, t I will let myself typically get up a little bit later than if I were working on videos. Number two, I uh, typically try to remove myself from the internet uh, or go to another place. You know, um, and I don't, for example, write in here in my office. I write on my laptop in the other room or in the library or something like that. Uh, three, I see myself a low limit of 2000 words per day. Um, and that is all I have to do, but I do have to do that. So it's 2000 words, but it's gotta be good words generally. And 2000 words over six to eight hours, there's only like, you know, 300-ish words an hour. What are your thoughts about trying to make the reader laugh? Okay, pet peeve time. I hate this so much. I hate when a writer makes a joke in their book and then writes that all of their characters laugh in response to it. And I, it just instantly makes it funny. It's like having a laugh track to your novel, but explicitly telling your reader that it's meant to be funny. The best jokes, the best and funniest writing is always like just in there. And it's funny because it's funny, right? It usually, at least for me, I don't know. Terry Pratchett and Douglas Adams both do this phenomenally. How did you go about editing your novel? I feel that's the section of writing advice I often don't see very often. I'm still learning a lot about editing, but personally, I have to take a step back. I think time is a really important part of editing. And that's because you need to be able to come to it with fresh eyes. You know, if you try to edit just like the following day, the thing that you made before, you're probably still going to be looking at it relatively similarly to how you were looking at it yesterday. I left it for a few months before I came back to edit this novel. Do you find that music strikes a similar level of appeal to you as other forms of writing? If so, what are your favorite songs, album, bands, and so on? My tastes in music, in stories, in my writing can all be summed up perfectly with three songs. Number one, Weight of the World from Near Automata. Number two, Death Stranding by Churches, okay? Number three, uh, Chasing Cars, but a cover of it by Tommy Prophet. You listen to those three songs, they are just, I, I, they make me feel so many things. Everything that those songs represent and touch on and feel like is what my novels feels like, is what my stories feel like. It's, it's what I think about a lot. It's very much that kind of like 
Maybe the world is falling apart, but there are still beautiful things in it. If you were to put out a professional book, what do you think it might be titled or about? Well, I've already told you about three kinds of silence, but again, I have been published, you know, as a short story author, uh, links down below. And those are things, you know, about like uh, two robots who are uh, exploring a post-apocalyptic, post-human world. Uh, there's one about a janitor on a generation ship who's trying to figure out what to do at this planet that they've just arrived at. There's one about this girl who figures out that the stars are slowly dying and what to do about it. YouTube questions. Okay, will you make a video on The Last of Us TV show? Yes, if it's not out yet, then it will be soon on the second channel to the future. Would your fiance say your on-air persona differs to your off-air persona? Oh, Laura, Laura, Laura. Uh, what, how, how am I on screen? What's my on screen persona like compared to like my real in person human persona? What, what am, what am I like? You do talk in video essay format when you're making conversations a lot of the time. Sometimes it's a little gibberish, but you are much more political in person yeah. than online. That's, 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 that's true. That's true. In my private life, I'm a very political person. Can we get a hello, Subfuries? Hey, Subfuries! <laughs> the cringe! If you don't know the story behind that, uh, good. I'm not telling you. You don't need to know. And you certainly don't need to check my old videos. Your most underrated and overrated YouTube videos. Overrated would be how Iroh got into the spirit world. It's got like millions of views and it's, it's just a god awful theory. It falls apart with the slightest scrutiny and I remember making it. I was running out of time. I didn't have a video together for that week. And I was like, oh, God, I, I, what do I do? What do I do? And I made that. And it's, it's just, it's not very good. It is not my best theory at all. Underrated, the end credits to humanity, which a lot of people really appreciated. And that's awesome. I just wish it had more views. You know, that's the job. <laughs> How do you talk so well to a camera? Oh, my friend. Oh, my friend. I need to show you something, okay? So, uh, let me take you back to the beginning. Hey, Subfuries. I'm done. It is finished. Does this look like the face of a man comfortable on camera? When I started out, I was so terrified of anyone hearing me that I would only film when I was in an empty lecture theater so that I didn't have to film at home when someone might come home and hear me. I would film outside, you know? It, it took me a long time to feel at ease. And to be perfectly honest, filming is still my least favorite part of this job. I love writing and I love the creative element of it, but I don't feel that natural, you know, being a persona, I guess. But I don't feel that natural in front of the camera as much as I try. It is something that comes with practice and I'm sure you'll figure it out. Is mayonnaise an instrument? No, Dylan. Mayonnaise is not an instrument. What has been the biggest lesson you've learned as a YouTuber and are there any ups and downs from your journey you'd like to share? Honestly, the hardest one is learning to separate your self-worth from how well your work or your video does. Um, it gets very difficult to judge, you know, if I'm doing well, if I'm doing right. Is it views? Is it subs? Is it income? Uh, is it how a video is received? My brain tends to default to the worst interpretation. And so it's been a long time practicing to, to, to you know, recognize that it's valuable because of what I put into it, of, of the labor of love there, and of what it might mean to the people who do see it, even if that's fewer people. What would a young Tim be surprised to know about your journey so far? Oh, that I interviewed Christopher Paolini? Do you have any idea how much I worshipped this guy as a kid? I mean, probably even more, you know, even just going back like a few years, that I am a professionally published author in good magazines. Magazines that, you know, I read and was like, wow, I wish I was published in this. And then I did, and that's cool. It did, it did so much for my confidence because I have had confidence issues with my writing for a long time. And... Yeah, so that, I guess. Could you please confirm what happens when we don't praise our Lord and Savior Mishka? Oh, in that case, well, are you going to do more book content? You make interesting and diverse uh, choices for books and make good points about them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really love the pattern of kind of the end of the year wrap up of the books I've um, read. I want to do more reviews um, and I want to do more deep dives into kind of like genres and stuff, which hopefully will let me touch on a lot more books. Which video are you most proud of and which one would you like to redo? Oh. Easy, redo soft magic systems are better and here's why. There are some complicated reasons why, but basically I didn't argue 
my point as well as I could have because I was trying to simultaneously promote the charity live stream that year uh, and I hadn't done any work for it and I was kind of panicking that no one was going to show up and stuff like that. So I would redo that one. My one that I'm most proud of would be my uh, complex relationship between mental illness and fiction. It continues to hold up, I'm pretty sure, and it's connected me with a lot of people. I'm still really proud of that work and it's, 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 I'm, it, yeah, I'm just, I'm happy with it. How do you see your analyses evolving going forward? Is there anything you really want to do or types of videos you want to move away from? I really want to do more videos like the compatibility problem, uh, as well as long form analyses of like particular games. For example, I've always wanted one to do one discussing Nier Automata or the Telos Principle. I'm possibly going to consider moving a little bit away from like lore videos. And that's just because I like to feel like I'm making content that only I can make or that it has more of me in it. If you could collaborate with one author, writer, director, or a big time creator for one project of your choosing, who and what would they be? Uh, I'd love to do some sort of work with um, John Green, potentially Savannah Brown. Uh, I think she's really talented. Uh, maybe Quinns from Shut Up and Sit Down. Uh, great guy. Plans for on writing and world building volume three. We've got number one, number two, number three is coming at the end of the year, I swear to you. What other YouTubers inspired you? I remember really distinctly sitting in my room and, and looking at, at OSP's content, Overly Sarcastic Productions, and seeing their stuff and going, man, I wish I could create things like this. And now they're coming to my wedding. <laughs> They are amazing people. What separates a good story from a great story in your opinion? I think it's particularly when a story isn't just good on a technical level, but it's about something profound. It's about something really meaningful that resonates with a lot of people and has a lasting cultural impact would probably be the difference there. New Zealand, and I'm surprised you have so many questions considering the country does not exist. When do you think the myth of New Zealand existing came about? Oh, so in 1688, when Sir Thomas More first invented the printing press. Um, he actually ended up accidentally printing the map of the new world, um, like the, the whole world, incorrectly. And what happened was um, part of like China split off and was printed in, in a different part of the map. And so basically all these explorers started coming to this area of the world thinking there's going to be like this new land, right? Um, and, uh, so it, it came to be called New, New Zealand because back then it was, they were saying, you know, do you see land? Do you see land? And if they would go, no. So no sea land. We do not see land. That's where that term came from. Uh, and of course it's just really stuck around, hasn't it? It's just stuck around. New Zealand is Australia's disowned kidney. This is a question. No. Australia is New Zealand's disowned body. We're a fine kidney on our own. We don't need you. We've been removed and we're off on a kidney adventure. Just tell me something about New Zealand. Okay, um, so our Bill of Rights Act, did you know that it specifically says that if any law contradicts the New Zealand Bill of Rights, that law takes precedence. <laughs> I'm going to New Zealand for the first time next year. What destinations are your must-sees and what aren't worth the hype? Uh, the Sky Tower in Auckland kind of sucks. Honestly, all of Auckland sucks. And the Glowworms um, Caves, or the, the main one up in the North Island, is not nearly as cool as a bunch of the ones that you can see down on the South Island. Um, they're just a lot less tainted. They don't have hundreds of tourists going through them. And they're gorgeous. I remember floating through an underwater river with just like thousands of them, like seeing a whole new night sky. People are gonna point you towards, uh, Milford Sound is definitely worth seeing, but honestly, some of the most beautiful things I've ever seen are just on like random walks across the West Coast. If you just find a place and look up all the walks around there, you're gonna see gorgeous nature everywhere. Just tell me something else about New Zealand. Uh, we, we invented bungee jumping. Uh, do you own a sheep? Yes, of course. He's, he's out there. I can see him right now. I mean, from, I'm from New Zealand. Of course I own a sheep. Uh, what's it like to live in a fantasy island? Now, I gotta be honest. It's, it's, it's great. I mean, but it is annoying because you're like, you're going through the supermarket and you're trying to like pick out, you know, your cereal and your groceries. And then suddenly there's goddamn hobbits running around your feet and you accidentally kick one and suddenly then the police are there. It's all 
It's all just nonsense. And if you ask them, you know, what's your business? They go, our business is our own. Ugh. Uh, please tell me something else about New Zealand. Uh, we have no natural predators, which basically meant that a ton of our birds lost the ability to fly. And now they're all endangered because, you know, we brought in cats and possums and they're killing them all and they can't fly away because they're too freaking fat. We did also have the largest bird in the world, the harst eagle, which was so big it could pick up children, carry them away and eat them. Personal questions. Thoughts on garlic bread? Oh, mm, perfect. Ever considered living in another country? Actually, yeah. I'm going to be moving to Europe for a couple of years at the end of this year. We're going to be moving from city to city, kind of a few months at a time. We're going to live in Italy, Croatia, Finland, uh, the UK, France, Germany, um, maybe Poland, uh, possibly Greece. Will there ever be a battle between you and the Goblin? If there were a battle, it would be in the final hours of this earth. And it would be on a battlefield of our choosing. It would come with storms, and fire, and floods, and all the earth would be scorched behind us until one of us was standing, and the other was fallen. Advice for your younger self when it comes to having a career on YouTube. Do not get so obsessed with your work that you take your entire desktop setup away with you on holiday when you are meant to be with friends so that you can make sure you don't miss an upload time. What psychopath does that? This one. What were some stories that defined your childhood or teenage years? Oh, it's difficult to explain just how much of an iron grip that Doctor Who had on me across my teenage years. Eragon, if you can tell by how damaged this copy is. The Artemis Fowl series. And, and I am not ashamed of this, the Warrior Cats series, okay? I love cats, it was fantasy, how cool is it? You can't get better than this, all right? Please, 30 seconds of uninterrupted Momo and an update of her health. Momo's fine, her legs are still screwed, but we let her out as much as we possibly can. Uh, she does meow a lot because she's obsessed with drinking shower water, even though she has a drinking fountain now and she loves that as well. And she tolerates Willow's existence. Which stories do you think influence you and your writing the most? Oh, Avatar in the early years. Like my fantasy novel, and I'm not kidding, was about the Guardians, four of them, each of whom controlled one of the elements. And they could enter a thing called status, where they were basically super-powered versions of their elements. I mean, it, it, it was not subtle. But now, uh, Arrival, uh, or Stories of Your Life by Ted Chiang, uh, Blade Runner 2049, uh, John Green, to an extent, uh, and uh, Beer Town you know, by uh, Frederick Bachman, who, yeah, his, 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 his writing inside his characters' minds is really good. Do you play d and I mean, what do you think? And these are the new pair of dice that I just got for Christmas. Can we focus in on those? How do you balance the channel with your day-to-day -day job? I am fortunate enough that between YouTube and Patreon and my books, I earn enough that I don't have to work another job. So thank you patrons, you guys are literally the best. The thing that makes this work. Can we see your favorite plant? My jalapeno plant. Get in there, show them my lemon. My other lemon tree. What made you want to pursue the YouTube channel and writing as opposed to being a lawyer and do you regret going to law school? So I always wanted to be a writer, right from a young age. Uh, and my parents were super supportive of that, but they also said, you've got to have something else. You've got to have a second option. So I went and got a law degree. Uh, and I actually did YouTube while I was doing my law degree for the most part um, in the last few years. Do I regret going to law school? Not at all, not in the slightest. Um, it was a hugely formative time for me as a person. I don't think I can separate it from that. But naturally when I left uni and I had the option to do this, I took it. 
Do you ever resent or feel wistful about how your YouTube career has gone, like getting siloed or typecast into content that you would not have chosen to do if you had free reign? I knew from a very early time that I needed to diversify my content. When I started making How to Train Your Dragon videos, I was already looking, I was like, okay, I can't do this forever, I need more, I need Avatar, cool. Once I had Avatar, okay, I gotta add Lord of the Rings, gotta add Elder Scrolls, and eventually I got onto the writing and world building stuff. And then, you know, I can basically make whatever I want. Um, yeah, I have things that I make regularly. I make avatar videos regularly, I make writing and world buildings video regularly, and Lord of the Rings stuff, but, um, you will see that I get to make a pretty wide variety of stuff. In fact, I've just about got a documentary coming out about Japanese war crimes. <laughs> and yeah, sure, sometimes I know I make videos because I know I need the views, I know I need the income, and, and that's okay, that's just part of it. But I'm lucky enough to have the flexibility that I do sometimes get to do those videos that are passion projects. How do you feel about The Last of Us HBO show? It is. Do you play video games? And if you do, what type of games do you generally prefer? I love puzzle games like The Talos Principle, and I love narrative-driven games like The Last of Us. But I also do love, you know, things like Nier Automata, which has an incredibly strong story, but also very action-oriented gameplay. I don't typically like shooters or games where there's just constant combat and fighting the entire time. Like, if I'm in a boss battle and I don't get it in the first, you know, eight to ten times, I'm just gonna put down the difficulty. I don't... I'm not invested enough usually in, in the fighting elements of a game to give it just like a hundred tries. What's a piece of media you enjoyed that you wish had a sequel? Rise of the Guardians. If anything was meant to be franchised, it was this and it was not. And it had one of the best animated villains we've had in like ages. Why? Why did we not get another one? Why did you not go to see it? What do you know about Bionicles? And this has a funny story behind it. Okay, so if you didn't know, Bionicles are like these little action figure Lego things that you would you would collect and build and they were super cool and I was obsessed with them as a kid and they were sort of elemental heroes you know one was fire and wind and earth and stone and darkness and stuff but they all had names which sounded like Maori um, who are the indigenous population of New Zealand you know they were named things like the Toa, um, Tahu, I think Liwa, uh, Matu Nui and for me as a kid I thought these were just like a New Zealand toy they were just uh, something that came from New Zealand because they were named after kind of like Māori things and, and that was our culture. And that's when I eventually learned that no, apparently uh, Hasbro or whoever owned them just like saw uh, the Māori language and was kind of like, oh, hey, let's just, let's just take and use that. Uh, except it's like not, it's like not Māori. It's just like kind of sounds like it, but it's all clearly inspired by it. And that caused a whole thing. Uh, and so it was not a loving tribute to uh, this this culture that I, you know, that, that I sort of grew up with, but uh, kind of just like capitalizing on it without asking, you know. What is your favorite video game of all time and why? Probably the Talos Principle. It's got some of the best designed puzzles I have ever seen of any game ever. Uh, better than Portal, I swear. And uh, it also has an incredible story with amazing little details that just make it super replayable. And thematically, I am really interested in artificial intelligence and consciousness and the soul and what those things even mean. And the, the game explores that really nicely. Uh, runner up would probably be Nier Automata, which is like the same themes. <laughs> Reading questions. What genre of literature do you enjoy the most and which one would you like to get into the future the most? Uh, I love literary sci-fi. So not like, you know, action, epic sci-fi with space battles and stuff, but things more like Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation. Uh, I really want to get into manga reading a lot more. I want to read um, Monster and Steins Gate, uh, but I just haven't really gotten around to them and manga is really expensive in New Zealand. Have you ever heard of the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Y? Is that the one the Jedi won't tell you? What is your favorite single paragraph in anything you've ever read? Not quite a paragraph, but it is definitely my favorite passage. This is from uh, Terry Pratchett's Hogfather. All right, said Susan, I'm not stupid. You're saying humans need fantasies to make life bearable. Really? As if it was some kind of pink pill? No, humans need fantasy to be human, to be the place where the falling angel meets the rising ape. Tooth fairies, hog fathers, little yes. As practice, you have to start out believing the little lies, so we can believe the big ones. Yes, justice, mercy, duty, that sort of thing. They're not the same at all. You think so? Then take the universe and grind it down to the finest powder and sieve it through the finest sieve and then show me one atom of justice, one molecule of mercy. And yet, 
Death waved a hand. And yet you act as if there is some ideal order in the world, as if there is some, some rightness in which the universe, by which it may be judged. Yes, but people have got to believe in that, or what's the point? My point exactly. That just touches on a lot of ideas I love. The best book you've read recently. Jeanette McCurdy's I'm Glad My Mum Died, and also one of the first non-fiction books I've ever really read. Which stories are you currently reading, listening to, or watching that you like to either review or have inspired in a possible video? I'm currently reading The Way Spring Arrives, which is by a variety of Chinese female authors, uh, as well as Nikita Gill's Where Hope Comes From, which is a poetry collection um, about, you know, resilience and healing and light. But I think I'd like to make a more detailed video potentially on The Last of Us. How many angry geese could you take on in a fight? More than one? Less than seven. It depends. Are they armed? Do you have a short story that you would recommend most highly of all the short stories you've read? I'm gonna say Te Chiang's story of your life. Uh, it means a lot to me personally. It's a beautiful story, an inspired arrival, and if you read it, you'll see, you know, kind of like where I kind of get inspired from for my own novel. You are often very deferential when giving book recommendations or talking about writing techniques being better or worse. Are you afraid of backlash from genre fiction fans? I've been enjoying watching you grow into literature at large and hearing you expand your knowledge and interests, but sometimes I feel like you downplay your own preferences and progress. Do you fear that your own growth and changing taste can seem offensive to some? I, I don't, fear this. You've keyed into something there that I have leaned a lot more into literary fiction, uh, but I very much still appreciate genre fiction, and to be honest, I don't think that there is a strong distinction between genre and literary fiction, not the way that some people, you know, um, like to think that there is, and I think that the skills that we see in literary fiction and genre fiction are very much ones that can be translated over, and when I talk about writing in my videos, I hope I try to communicate that, that, you know, these potentially more literary techniques can help heighten the things that you want to do in a genre um, story, and, 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 and equally the other way around. The more I read, the more I see how blurred those lines are, and I deliberately stay away from saying, you know, certain styles are necessarily better or worse. Um, I, some techniques might be more effective at, at communicating certain things and accomplishing certain things, but I, I do tend to stay away from you should do this, that sort of thing. I don't like that terminology. Uh, and, and while I think it's worth recognizing that, you know, maybe Marvel is not the storytelling pinnacle of the world, genre fiction still tells incredibly powerful stories that really impact people, and that's worth recognizing, that's worth studying. And that is the more important kind of side of storytelling for me. You know, it's about how we connect with ourselves and our, and others and the world around us. But I also want to give us more skills with perhaps those more technical, more literary techniques as well. People who look down on genre fiction or think that it's worse, I think don't quite understand genre fiction as well as they think they do. Drawing that line the way they do. Tropes you hate or tropes you like slash love. I have a real weakness for conspiracy stories. You know, when like, uh, you don't know who you can trust and then the guy in the government is working for the bad people in the betrayal moment. But I hate misunderstanding trope. You know, the one where like the girl sees the guy and he's on a date with another woman, but it's actually his sister and she goes, oh no, he's cheating on me with someone else. And that's the entire driving force of the conflict. Nope, hate that. And I also quite dislike um, some mental health uh, tropes, like where the person gets better because of love, or um, the entire issue is probably being solved too quickly. Oftentimes, the issues that someone faces mentally are most intense at their halfway point and not like at the end. Patrick Gabrielson, what is your favorite fruit? Also, can I have a mango beside my name? There you go, Patrick. And for versatility reasons, it's gotta be an apple. You don't have to prepare it, you can just take it with you, it's fantastic, it's not fiddly, great. Uh, but for taste reasons, it's gotta be a raspberry, right? Gotta be a raspberry. And for the spicy every so often, it's gotta be a kiwi fruit. Gotta be a kiwi fruit. Your favorite story ever told, Blade Runner 2049 or The Fellowship of the Ring, probably. What is a book that has changed your life, if you have any? Um, I read you that passage from Hogfather. But the other one would be one I read just a couple of years ago, and that'd be um, Margaret Atwood's The Testaments. That really left an impact on me um, for a bunch of personal reasons. Avatar questions. 
If you were in charge of making Avatar The Last Airbender, how would it have differed and what would you have added? Uh, I probably would have added a few episodes after Zuko joins the group um, to solidify that dynamic more. I would have foreshadowed uh, Aang's energy bending a lot more. And I potentially would have dealt with the romance between Aang and uh, Katara differently. Are you as worried as me that the Avatar franchise will one day end up like Star Wars or Marvel with a crazy output that will just be milked endlessly because executives want money no matter if the story is slowly ruined? At the moment, it's still in the hands of a relatively small group of people. And so far, you know, the output of like the Yang Chen and Kyoshi novels has been actually pretty good. Already we've had the comics for a number of years, which to be perfectly honest, are pretty hit or miss. Uh, but I'm not that worried about it so long as it's kind of in the hands of a concentrated creative mind that knows what they're doing. Is that the case? I don't know, we'll see. There is a lot more money behind Star Wars and Marvel than there is behind Avatar. And until there's that much money behind it, I'm not that worried. General thoughts on the Kyoshi novels. Have you read the Yang Chen one yet? I've read all three of them and the Yang Chen novel was really, really good. Honestly, a bit anticlimactic, but it was still good for what it was. And the Kyoshi novels were, I think, a really good addition to the world. They're mature in a way that the series needed to go and they build pretty naturally on the world building of the original series. Do you remember the very first time you ever watched Avatar The Last Airbender? Do you have any special memories attached to it? So for me, we didn't have like the special channels, the cable channels. So I, I couldn't watch it when it was coming out, when it was in order. I got it kind of second hand and I only managed to watch it if I got home from my swimming training um, quick enough and I managed to catch that just the, the half an hour period that it was shown in. So I got all of the episodes out of order initially and I actually didn't get to watch the entire series until I was in my later years of high school in the order that it was intended as much as I always wanted to. You know, I just, I just couldn't get access to it. It's New Zealand is sometimes pretty limiting in that sense but I was still obsessed with it from a young age. I think my first episode might have possibly been something like The Deserter. Uh, I'm not quite sure. There you go, that is 70 questions and I got hundreds of them and I've, I'm gonna put out a second video on the second channel where I answer all of the other questions, okay? So you can go check that out there where I kind of rapid fire through those ones, all right? That'll be good. One million, it's a hell of a number. I hope that I can continue to make stuff that you guys are invested in and like. But yeah, one million. I remember how vividly I thought when I was just starting out, I thought if I get to 10,000, I'll be happy. If I get to 100,000, I'll be happy. And that number keeps keeps going up, right? But it's, it's not about the number in the end and that you still gotta realize that. It's, it's about, you know, making stuff that, that matters to you, that you care about, that you're happy with. And I'm really lucky to even have the opportunity to do that in the first place. I dreaded when I was at uni not being able to pursue something creative in life. And you guys have given me the opportunity to do that. To be able to live one that's so creatively fulfilling. I honestly can't explain how much that means to me. Psychologically, mentally you know, emotionally that I get to tell stories and be a part of other people telling stories. I love this job. I love everything I get to do in it. And you know, there are good, there are good parts and bad parts to it. There are always good parts and bad parts to every story, to every job. But this one's pretty, pretty damn lucky, pretty damn good. Thank you um, for, for being part of the community, for participating, for listening and sending your questions. I was floored by how many people like were just being there and being part of it. Because sometimes, yeah, you sort of forget. Stay nerdy and I'll see you in the future.